that I'm live. Hello, everyone. That I'm live. Hello, everyone. Yes, I like hollow notes. Okay. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the virtual world. My name is Taisha Wood. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a member of the Navajo Nation. I currently reside in Scottsdale, Arizona. I live with my family there and on my husband's land, which is the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. A little bit about myself. Uh, first, I wanted to acknowledge the team, uh, the conference coordinators, and Dr. Morgan for allowing me to speak this afternoon or this morning on human trafficking. My title really is kind of confusing. Um, it's I wanted to talk about the laws in Indian country as it relates to human trafficking. And there's a little bit of component in there with sexual abuse. So hence we have the knowing the law, uh, and really understanding the law of human trafficking and sexual abuse in Indian country. My background in law enforcement, I think you can go to the next screen. Uh, I used to be a police officer and a detective. I served 17 years in law enforcement uh, within the state of Arizona, within Indian country in Arizona. Um, I am also a mom of two beautiful kids. And as I mentioned, I currently reside in the homeland of the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. As a police officer, I came into um, my experience with human trafficking was as a detective, I was assigned a case. I was very fortunate enough to attend a fellowship focusing on human trafficking in the country. I did that with the Health and Human Services a few years ago. Um, my action plan was focused on basically how do we bridge the training and the awareness for human trafficking as it relates in Indian country because it's a different lens because it's Indian country. Um, there's a lot of components behind that and this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the laws of Indian country, jurisdiction, sovereignty, we're gonna talk about the culture of a nation, a tribal nation, and those factors involved in that nation, and how all these factors and issues can and, and does apply to combating human trafficking within our, our communities. But really, before we combat it, we have to understand it. And then if we wanna combat it, we need those laws to combat that, right? Um, so the next couple, next hour, we will talk about a little bit of this, a little bit of that, um, to give you a better understanding of the complexities of Indian country, but really the resilience of Indian country and how we can gather that and, and help fight human trafficking in our communities. Like I said, there's a lot to cover and we only have an hour, maybe an hour less because I did that musical intro. <laughs> um, so when you we leave today, we walk out the doors and uh, I end here, you'll probably have a lot more questions than you know than you started off with. And some things we've discussed that I'll try to explain, do my best to explain, but I really want you to have these questions so you can go out and seek those answers, right? To be aware and to have those understandings. Because this hour that we're going to go through material, um, law students in Indian country sit through semesters and semesters of this. Um, you know, I've lived and grew up in Indian country and Navajo Nation. There's still a lot of questions I have about my culture. There's still a lot of questions I have about the government. You know, so this hour is, I hope, captivates you and encourages you to learn, to learn a little bit more about Indian country specifically human trafficking in the country. So we're gonna go over, I broke it down into three sections. We're gonna go talk about sovereignty. We are gonna talk about jurisdiction. And 
we are going to take those two qualities, I'm sorry, those two topics, and discuss how these apply to um, Indian country. The conference is on human trafficking. So I won't go over the definition of human trafficking, but I just wanted to do a refresher. So when I speak of human trafficking, I may have the notion to say sex trafficking, because that's what I'm most familiar with in my investigations is sex trafficking. So uh, again, human trafficking includes both sex trafficking and labor trafficking, but majority of my talk will be focused on sex trafficking. Um, I want to talk about sexual abuse. Again, my experience with law enforcement as a detective, a lot of our cases were sexual abuse. Um, I was specifically assigned to crimes against children. So majority of that was sexual abuse investigations, um, as well as uh, child abuse, physical child abuse. Now you've heard me say this term quite a few times, Indian country. And I want to talk first about what Indian country is and um, how we define that. So in law enforcement, I went to the State Police Academy in Arizona, um, working for a federally recognized government. I was allotted uh, um, federal, I could apply federal charges to an incident if through my investigation, I revealed that a federal crime had been com committed. If you can go to the next slide. So if you look at the federal guidelines, um, actually I skipped this slide. Um, there's a term Indian country. That's okay. That's okay. We can go for this. There's a term Indian country and it apply, you know, when we're talking about Indian country, I want you guys to understand what I mean by Indian country um, because there's a lot of different names. It, the term Indian country is actually in the federal guidebook and I'll show you a slide of that. But um, in speaking of tribal nations, a lot of different terminology is used. There's Native Americans, there's Indian, uh, American Indians. Uh, sometimes within a tribe, you just hear uh, natives, when we refer to each other, sometimes we say, you, you know, I'm a native. Um, there's also the term indigenous, you know, indigenous nations. Um, you know, and when we talk about tribal nations, sometimes you hear the word reservations. A lot of tribes and communities are going away from the term reservations and using nations. Um, you have colonies in Nevada. They have colonies there. There's rancherias in California. So there's so many different words out there when we're talking about Indian country um, and different references. And those are purely based on um, what the, the, the community you chooses to use. For example, the Navajo Nation, we use the Navajo Nation as opposed to the Navajo Reservation. So a little bit more about Indian country um, because there's all these different words that communities use or people use, um, my experience in law enforcement, we use the, those, that terminology and those definitions. So that brings us to Indian country. So this is taken from the federal codes and it, in the federal codes, and again, this is the, the laws of the United States. They use the term Indian country and the term Indian. So you won't see Native American, you won't see American Indian. You'll see the term Indian in the, in the federal codes. when when we're talking about uh, tribal lands or um, charges for a, a Native American, American Indian or indigenous person. Um, I know this is confusing. Again, it's to kind of understand what we're gonna talk about and what, how it affects tribal nations. I, I really wanted to give you an idea of those components that you know, it begins from um, these definitions and how, how we address ourselves. But, so this is the, the code, um, the federal guidelines. Uh, you can see that it says, Indian means any person who's a member of an Indian tribe, uh, who's eligible to become a member of Indian tribe. Um, and this is under the Indian Reorganization Act. You can go to the next slide. So this is anybody who's able or reference to be um, enrolled in a tribe, it says on the previous slide. So in case you didn't know, this morning there was mentioned, First Lady talked about, if you heard uh, 
the discussion this morning. She says there's over 500 federally recognized tribes. Um, there's actually 574 federally recognized tribes. So this is all across the United States. Now, if you break that down, not all states have federally recognized tribes within them. Arizona has 22. Alaska, it being one of the biggest uh, states that we have, has over 200 federally recognized tribes. California, I believe, has, anybody wanna take a guess on how many tribes are federally recognized in California? Someone from the audience says 110. Very good, let's give that person a prize. <laughs> it, it's 109. I've heard 104, but 109, so pro approximately 110, that's good. Uh, so taking away Alaska and their 200 and the lower 48, there's about 300. Then you take out California, that's um, 100 from their 300. So the rest of the states are about 200 tribal tribes and nations. That's a lot of tribal nations, right? It's a lot of tribal governments and sovereign nations. So that term in there is sovereign. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what does sovereignty mean? This morning's discussion talked about uh, the sovereignty of the Navajo Nation. And of these 574 tribes, each of them is a sovereign nation through the eyes of the United States government. So that means they're able to govern themselves. That's, that means they can enact their own laws to protect themselves as a nation. They elect their own leadership. Um, leaderships, there's not a, a code book that everybody goes by for all of Indian country. So each nation determines how they're gonna elect their leaders. And they even determine who, and I'm sorry, what terms they're gonna use for their leadership. The Navajo Nation has a, a president of the Navajo Nation and a vice president of the Navajo Nation. We have a first lady of the Navajo Nation. Um, you go to Southern Arizona, the Gila River Indian community, they use the term governor. They use it for their leadership. They use the term lieutenant governor um, for their second in command. You go to the Hopi tribe, which is in central Arizona. Um, I'm sorry, northern Arizona, but in the center of the Navajo Nation. So you have a nation within a nation. So the Hopis, they use the terminology chairman and uh, vice chairman or chairwoman and vice chairwoman. So again, 574 tribal nations enacting their own laws, governing themselves, doing their own elections. They choose their, their terms for leadership. They, they choose those laws for their nation. So anything within the boundaries of their nation. Um, and the purpose of this is again, it's to ensure their way of life, to ensure their culture, to ensure their, um, their health, their education of their communities and you know, basically the way of life. And this sovereignty is huge in any country. We value it. We never want to lose our sovereignty um, because it enables us to have so many rights to protect our own, to protect um, ourselves and protect the seven generations. That's a term that Native Americans like to talk about is the things and decisions that we make now, we've got to consider the seven generations from here. So there's a lot to think of and a lot to consider when we're talking about how do we enact, enact laws to protect our community. Um, jurisdiction. This one, again, could be something we talk about for an entire semester, in fact, an entire year in law school. So Indian country has more than one way of defining itself in terms of jurisdiction. So I, like I said, I went to, um, when I became a police officer, I went to State Police Academy, but that's, this was for a tribal uh, community in Arizona. So within the community, we have tribal laws because of our sovereignty. We also enforce state laws because we're state officers. Um, because we work for a federally recognized tribe, right? Because we work for a federally recognized tribe, we as law enforcement have the authority to charge federal um, charging uh, if we take, if we, if we honor the, um, there's, there's criteria, we have to go to class, we have to do, seek additional courses, we have to pass these courses and then we're given special certification. It's called a 
law, special law enforcement certification. So that means we can try in three different courts, um, the federal court, the state court, and the tribal court. This morning's discussion with Captain, I'm sorry, with Director Henderson, he talked about that ability to be able to charge someone in tribal court as well as federal court. Um, some people will say, well, isn't that double jeopardy? You guys familiar with that term? Like you can't try someone for the same thing. Well, because we are sovereign nation, we can do so. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The last thing of I wanted to know, um, mention, it was it was discussed earlier too, and those of you from California may know that California is a public law 280 state. There are six states in the United States that are identified as PL280, public law 280 states. One is Alaska, California is the other, Oregon, Nebraska, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. So public law 280 states too, to explain in simple terms, means the state, like for example, California authorized, the tribes in California authorized the state to um, come onto their land and assist with charging. Basically, a, a state police officer can arrest somebody on tribal land and they could, that person can go to state court. So this is really confusing, I know. <laughs> but that's Indian country, it's confusing, it's complex. And why am I saying all this again? I think it's very important that we understand when we're talking about Indian country, the challenges and the complexities again, but this little, this confusion, again, um, we, we should understand when we're talking about Indian country, what, what laws apply there, right? And is it a state governed law? Is it a PL-280 state? Um, if I'm going to charge a federal crime, am I able to do so? Is there a federal component to this crime that was committed? Lots of stuff comes into play when we're talking about knowing the laws of human trafficking in Indian country. So that we have two public, public law 280 states. Uh, recap, there's tribal, there's state, there's federal, there's PL 280. And if that isn't confusing enough, I mean, because this is what our brain looks like right now, right? Right, we, I, I'm, I'm sure those of you in the audience, you know, I've got a couple people walking out because this is too much for them. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, they're not walking out. Uh, but yeah, the public law 280, come in, they're walking out, but they're coming back in. So there's, it, it, it's confusing. It's a web of confusion. Um, but to add to it, I wanted to throw something out in the mix and this is recent development um, regarding laws. Can go to the next slide. Um, actually, before we get into that, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the case law that, that provides these jurisdictions that we're talking about, other sovereignty. Um, this morning, Director Henderson talked about um, the federal guidelines and how to charge and how to do a tribal charge and a federal charge for, uh, for Navajo. Now, not all tribes have that authority. Navajo Nation, we have a police department there. We have an uh, ordinance, a criminal code, and a civil code. Um, some nations do not. And the government, in 1978, there was a case law that was decided on who has authority to charge a non-native on tribal land. So again, thinking about Indian country, you think about 574 tribal nations sovereign nations, each of them have to consider this case law. And basically this says, um, it's from 1978, like I said, it's all a font for Shistaquamish Indian tribe. A non-native said, was arrested in a, tribal, in a tribal nation within the boundaries of a tribal nation. He argued that that nation does not have authority to arrest him because he's a non-member. He's not a member of any tribe, any federally recognized tribe, he's a non-member. So the government ruled in his favor and said, yes, that's right. We, this tribal nation, the sovereign nation does not have authority to arrest a non-native. So please keep that in the back of your mind. We're gonna talk a little bit about criminal jurisdiction. This case law basically binds the hands of law enforcement. When a crime is committed, we have to consider a few factors. You know, is my suspect native? Is my suspect non-native? Is my victim native? Is my victim non-native? Again, put this on the side. 
write that down on notes for those of you watching online. We're gonna bring this back up later. Another case law I want you to understand, or in case you haven't heard about it, is United States versus Wheeler. Remember I talked about um, double jeopardy, how tribal nations can um, charge in a tribal court and as well as a federal court if, there is that, if, the federal, if the federal guidelines are met for that prosecution. So this case law says, this is possible. This is the Supreme Court saying, yes, we have that authority because nations, tribal sovereign nations are sovereign. So you can have um, a sex crime being committed. And if I were investigating it and I have in the tribal codes, I've met every criteria to prosecute with, within the tribal limits of that code. I can now take that case and submit federal charging for this individual if those federal charges um, are aligned with the with the crime that was committed. So ultimately this person can receive time and be charged in tribal court and then go to federal court and receive and be sentenced if he's charged with those crimes. So that's a plus on our side, right? We can protect to a certain extent a non, I'm sorry, a member of a community because again, they have to meet the criteria for tribal court. So they have to be a member of a federally recognized tribe to be tried in that tribal court. Um, and why is that there? Because of the previous case law, Ollie Font versus Suquamish, right? I know it's confusing. It's so confusing. And I've, I've burned 15 minutes on terminology. Uh, there's so much more we can talk about. But again, I know some of you are like, why is she talking about this? And I just, I feel it's the value it, it is so important. You know, and, and we're addressing, again, human trafficking laws. So the next case law I wanted to bring up, um, this is a very recent uh, case that went before Supreme Court. Um, this individual was arguing that a tribal police officer does not have the authority to detain him within the boundaries of a federally recognized tribe. Um, uh, Supreme Court just recently heard arguments on this. Um, basically what happened is a police officer saw a car abandoned on the side of the road um, he approached it, you know, to make sure everything was okay. There was a non-native in there. There was drugs within that, um, within the vehicle. So the tribal law enforcement detained him. So the suspect, this person in the vehicle is saying, no, you don't have the authority to detain me because I'm not a native of any tribe. So this is going into the argument um, right now being seen on um, whether or not this law enforcement has authority to, because a crime is being committed and whether or not he could detain to bring in state officials. Um, interesting, laws change every day. And I feel like I shouldn't say this and bring this up, but I really feel it's relevant again. So there's another case law that happened within recently that affects Indian country. Can we go to the next slide? So this is McGirt versus Oklahoma. Anybody hear about McGirt versus Oklahoma? It's a good answer for me because I can talk about it now. <laughs> so McGirt uh, is from Oklahoma. He committed a crime in Oklahoma and he was in within the boundaries of Oklahoma. So let's back up a little bit and talk about Oklahoma and the, 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 the jurisdiction. So Oklahoma is like a checkerboard. So they have some tribes, they have, you step, walk maybe five meters and then you're in a non-tribal land. Then you walk another five meters and then you're back on tribal land. So it's checkerboard. So you have tribal law, you have state law, and you have federal, again, if there's um, jurisdiction there for a federal crime. So McGirt committed a crime. It was a sex abuse crime. And he argued to the Supreme Court, he said, state charges do not apply to me I can commit a crime, but state charges cannot be administered here because this land belongs to Muskogee Creek land. There was a treaty signed. So it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the, Sup the Supreme Court upheld this and said, you know what, this individual's right. Oklahoma signed a treaty many years ago and they kind of forgot about it. So now you're looking at these five main tribes in Oklahoma, so basically Eastern Oklahoma is now really considered 
It's still federal land. It has always been federal land. The tribes probably argued it and said, this is our land, this is federal land, but you know, somehow communication was mixed up. And so the state started applying state charges for crimes. So McGirt kind of clarified that and did tribal nations a favor because now the Supreme Court is saying, that's right, the tra- we have the treaty here. So now all that land is considered federal land by the government, even though natives already said, that's our life, you know, thanks for backing us up government, basically. <laughs> so then what do, you think, what do you think happens with those crimes that were charged stateside and they were, they were Native Americans? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a headache. It's, yeah, they could be thrown out. Um, so the, the Oklahoma is working on that now. There's, uh, you, there's a lot of things, and we're not going to even get into that, but you talk about time, um, the factor when crimes were committed, but they are certainly now reevaluating things. Um, things such as uh, DUI charges. So some tribes, because of their sovereignty, again, remember that word sovereignty? Some tribes do not share information such as DUIs. So um, one of the communities I worked with if you had a DRAD uh, driving while intoxicated, you have that charge and it goes to tribal court because you're a tribal member, um, that charge stays within the court system of the tribe. They do not have to report to the state MVD that you received a DUI within that, the, that community. So then you think back and um, what happened with McGirt. So now they're, the the non-state agencies are working with the tribes and there's things now that can be shared because of this. Um, It's it's not so much a headache that I think it's progress. Again, land was acknowledged again that it's it's federal territory. Um, Now they have a better grasp or control for those charges that are committed, those crimes that are committed within that territory. It is is confusing, but um, I told you, this is like, this could be a... (laughs) A semester in law school. So Indian country, state, I'm sorry, tribal laws, state laws, federal guidelines, you have public law 280. And now you have McGirt versus the United States just to just to mix it all, keep us on our toes. <laughs> now, when I was talking about McGirt, I told you that he actually was convicted of a sex crime. I believe it was a, a sex crime against a minor. So if we were to look at that now, and let's say, you know, McGirt happened and then another individual is committing a crime, how do we determine who has jurisdiction of this crime? How does Director Henderson, when he's on the Navajo Nation, understand or acknowledge who has, if Navajo Nation has jurisdiction to convict or charge or investigate a certain situation? So there are a couple of questions that we have to ask ourselves. And these are things that I was trained in as a law enforcement officer. Um, you know, where did the crime occur is probably the first question we need to answer. Was it within federal lands? Was it within the territory of the tribe that I work for? Or was it in the state? Um, another question we have to ask is, okay, who's involved? Our suspect and our victim, are they non-native or are they native? Um, and that determines what court you're gonna be sending your charges to. So if my victim, let's again, let's say it's a sex abuse case. If my victim is non-native and my suspect is non-native, then I would choose a state court for state charges. And I would look at the charges applicable through the state. If my suspect is non-native and my victim is native, does the tribal court have authority for this non-native to be prosecuted? I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking for people shaking head there. No, thank you, sir. <laughs> so they would have to go to federal court because he's a non-native um, and because the tribe doesn't have uh, authority to prosecute. So again, confusing, right? Now, Looking at human trafficking, these are things that we have to navigate when we're gonna, we have sex trafficking laws, labor trafficking um, crimes. You know, we have to consider all of this. Where did the crime occur? Who is our suspect? Who is our victim? Um, you know, 
And this is in addition to the resources available for our victims. What resources are available within the tribe, which is huge, which is something that we, sh you know, we should start talking about now. That's, that's for my next class. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Now, how do we tie this all in? Sovereignty, jurisdiction, human trafficking. This, these tribal nations that you see up here, that there's seven. Two, four, six, yeah, seven. And nobody, nobody added anything, well, <laughs> in transition. So there's seven tribes. These tribes are all federally recognized tribes. They all have sovereign governments. They have their own governing body. They have enacted their own laws. And these seven tribes actually set the precedents for other tribes right now because these are the first tribes in Indian country to implement an act. And some of them have prosecuted suspects for human trafficking in their communities. So the very first tribe to do this, to implement their own human trafficking tribal law is the Mandan Hadatsa Akira tribe, the MHA nation, which is in North Dakota. So this, their experience was brought to light probably in about 2015. And they saw what was happening in their communities with their children and how their, the teenagers were being lured away from homes and um, they saw the criminal activity increase in their community. So this was again brought to light in 2015. If you can go to the next story, we can stay here for a little bit. So the stories that happened, you know, they're hearing stories of their children being involved and lured into criminal acts, uh, criminal sex acts for money. Um, a group of ladies, grassroots organization got together and said, this cannot be happening in our communities. This cannot be happening to our children. So they said, okay, how are we gonna change this? Well, we gotta change the laws within our community. Let's start with our tribe first. So they did so, and this is a, if you look on the, I have the website here to look it up, but they actually have this law. This is their resolution back in 2014. Um, I messed up on the dates. They, they applied this in 2014. I think they passed in 2015, but you can um, correct me if I'm wrong on that when you do your fact check. <laughs> so what I, wanna, what I wanna talk about a little bit here is one, the resolution, but you can't see that. That's on the left side of your screen. On the right side, and if you look smack dab in the center of this, and then for those of you that are in the audience, I know it's really small, but they have language in here and it's, ter it's terminology. They define sexual intercourse, they define sexual contact, they defined John Doe and Jane Doe, they define victim restitution. But what's interesting about their, their, um, their law is they define traditional restitution. So on this, I'm just gonna quote it really quick. It says, uh, it, tra traditional restitution is defined as customary or traditional compensation um, as determined by judicial notice. Uh, and it's talking about basically stuff that's not that, it's, it, it's things that you probably wouldn't see in state restitution or state laws. So what this means is when they charge somebody with human trafficking within the MHA nation, they can apply things like withdrawing their fishing license which may not seem very good, right? I mean, like you're like, well, fishing license, but in some tribal communities, this is, this is golden. This is their, may, we, their means of life. This is how they um, uh, provide for their family. This is something that they've done for years and years and years. So when you take away their fishing license and their right to hunt, this affects somebody. So this court is thinking about those considerations in a tribal perspective. Right? It's not just about money, but you mean you're gonna pay somebody back or you're gonna to go to jail. No, we're gonna we're gonna take from you because you took from our community or you're hurting our community. So it's that cultural lens, I think, that we have to start thinking about and considering when we enact these laws, but also when we establish the sentencing for laws. You know, um, it's not 
solutions may not be in the westernized view. Let's go back, you know, we talked about, um, you know, First Lady talked this morning about bringing it back to family. So this kind of applies the same way. So we're gonna, we're, we're gonna talk a little bit more about how culture plays a huge part in our, um, our response to human trafficking, especially the laws. So when MHA talked about their laws and talked about how they're gonna implement those laws and what, what, what was the best way to um, carry out these laws, they of course thought about their culture. And Navajo Nation did the same thing when they enacted these laws. Um, you know, why, one, why do we need these laws? But two, what can we do to, to protect our community? Again, remember the seven generations. We are making decisions now to affect the seven generations. Um, it's not about us now, it's about the well being and our future of our children. So, the 574 federally recognized tribes, we all have a different language. There may be similar dialects, but basically, we have a different language. We have a different culture in terms of kinship when we describe the people in our family. Uh, we have different creation stories and origin stories. Um, we may have, there may, again, there may be similarities, but really, again, it's, we, we are all our own people and 574 nations. So if you um, go back and you visit the Navajo Nation, you go back to uh, Maine and you say, I went to the Navajo Nation, I visited its tribe. Um, that's really great. You've only, you know one tribe. You can't go back and say, I know about Indian country now. I went to the Navajo Nation. No, you just know about the Navajo Nation, which is really great to know. But every, well, my point is everybody's different. Our laws are different. Our way of thinking, our thought process, our language, our speech, our songs are different. And it's because of the stories that we have lived through and the stories of our ancestors. Now, how does this apply to law? Um, as a detective, you know, I've been on calls where, uh, unfortunately, circumstances, a child is reporting, disclosing that they were abused by their uncle or they were abused by their um, sister, um, whether it's a child or an adult. So you hear that, that relationship, you hear that kinship there. Um, in, my, in my family and within the Diné culture, uh, an aunt can be somebody that I've never met before because of our clans. Um, a sister can just be somebody that I grew up with. They could be my cousin, but I'm a, they are my sister and everybody will, know that we're sisters. Or um, like I said, our clans, I could travel to Alaska and go get coffee somewhere. And if somebody sees that I'm native because we all kind of know when we're native, we'll look like, hey, you native? <laughs> so you know so-and-so? <laughs> it's huge if you travel. Um, some people know in the audience what I'm talking about. But so, you know, one of the things we often say is like, what's your clan? So when we talk about our clan, so I'm at the coffee shop in Alaska and I say my clan and there happens to be another Navajo there um, because we're like Starbucks, we're everywhere. There's 405 enrolled members in the Navajo Nation. I was just updated on that number a few weeks ago. 405,000, I'm sorry, I forgot the thousand. 405,000. So I'm in Alaska and I say my clan and there's a Navajo gentleman there and he could be my grandpa because of my clan. I've never seen him before. I don't know his name, but now I do. Now he's my grandpa. And now I got to buy him coffee because he's my grandpa. <laughs> That's how it works in the Indian country. So going back to my story of someone disclosing a crime that was made or committed. Um, in the, in the non-cultural lens, okay, I take into account and I find out that, okay, this is not an uncle or sister that committed the crime. They're not even blood related. So now it's not it's not domestic violence because it's not familial or um, it's not as important. I, I don't want to say that, but I'm, basically what I'm trying to say is when we look at it in a cultural ways, we don't say, okay, well, you're not related, but you, that's my sister because that's who I know who she is. That's what I've always known her to be. Um, you have to apply that lens with when these laws come into play. You can't disregard what somebody has known, grow, known their entire lives. So again, looking at laws, you have to look at those, those kinships and those crimes that are committed 
in Indian country, you, have, you should definitely consider the kinship of the community that you're working for. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So I talked about language and translation is not, not, cannot, is not easy sometimes. Sometimes there's not no direct word uh, to translate. Uh, I was speaking with a, in a tribal community once and I was talking about language and they talked about how there's no words for thank you or please in their community and there has never been because their thoughts and their, their teachings were that years and years ago when they lived in their villages, everybody has a role and everybody has a purpose in that community. And if an elder needed firewood, um, she shouldn't say, please, can you go get me firewood? Somebody should already be doing that. You know, somebody, it's a role in that, in that village for them to take care of their elders. And if it's providing firewood that day, it, that's what they're doing. It. And then the same connotation that, it's the same notion that tri that tribal elder shouldn't say thank you because again it was that it's expected it's that role that someone's supposed to fulfill it's that purpose in that community so the, it's interesting to hear stories like that because in Navajo we have a yeah thank you um, so I mean everybody's different and understanding that thought process is very important when we're talking about when we're going to implement laws. Uh, against human trafficking. How much time do I have here? I don't see anybody. About 15 minutes? Okay. So this is, a, as you can see, those of you that visited, were in person, visited Navajo Nation, you probably saw Hogan. Um, the Hogan is basically one open room, which has a stove, you can cook in there, you can sleep in there. Um, it, it's, it's one room. As a detective uh, for crimes against children, we use a forensic interviewer. And this person is trained to talk to children about what happened to them. So I was in Phoenix and my victim was a child, minor. Um, she was being interviewed by a non-native and um, a story came into play about how this non-native person, she's interviewing again a native child. Um, and this story was just told to me by an, another interviewer. She said that she was interviewing a child from the Navajo Nation and that child was a witness and the interviewer was asking her, okay, well, what happened here? Um, what happened? Can you tell me what you saw? So the child saying, well, I saw so-and-so get up and walk to the, the bed and get in her bed. And the interviewer says, okay, well, what happened next? And the girl's telling us the story, what she saw. And the interviewer was confused at one point because she says, okay, do you share the room with this person, with the other child? And the young girl says, no. And the, the interviewer says, okay, well, were you in the same room as the suspect because you saw him get up and go into the other room? And she says, no. And so in the interviewer's mind, she was thinking about walls within a home, right? And so this, what this child was telling her didn't make sense in her head because the child kept saying, I saw him get up out of his bed and go to her bed and go to her bedding and get in. For all for this child, she was describing a Hogan. They lived in a Hogan. Again, it's one room. So everybody's in the same room. So the child was not lying. Um, you know, it was just a lack of um, cultural considerations for that forensic interviewer. So again, you talk about laws, but you also should uh, Director Henderson talked about cultural considerations that law enforcement should um, classes to take, you know, if, especially if they're um, non-tribal jurisdictions assisting with the Navajo Nation, they have to sit through this class. And it's very important because you don't want to mess up a case because you don't believe a, a victim or a witness because it just doesn't make sense in your head because you weren't told a little bit more about the culture of that community. But I thought it was very important to share that story with you because you don't really think about language and how important it is or even, um, you know, how some locations may have major significance to a community or to a child. And so when they're, or to a person, when they were doing descriptions, um, maybe they don't want to talk about what happened to them because of all these components or all these traditional um, taboos, um, cultural teachings. Uh, I put on their locations on this because uh, 
communities, law enforcement, I'm sorry, tribal communities have a lot of landmarks that have cultural significance to them. So again, just something to think about when you're talking about language is so much more involved. You can go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> I think I have time to just write. <laughs> so I know we didn't talk specifically about how to implement laws within our community. It's because if I were to give you a definition, if I were to give you a template on saying this is how one nation can implement human trafficking laws, it works for that one nation. It doesn't work for all the, the 574 federally recognized tribes. So how do we get to that point where people, tribes like MHA, the Mandan, Hadatsa, Akira Nation can implement their own law? It's because they took it upon themselves. Navajo Nation's on that list as well. They took it upon themselves and they said, okay, they set the precedent, they set the guidelines, they provided terminology. Um, so you can enact laws, but you should also consider the next steps. How are we gonna sentence these laws if they're tried, if they're prosecuted? And it's within our court system. You know, how are we gonna, um, how are they gonna, you know, are they just gonna serve time or are they gonna do something else? Um, you know, another extension of that is services. What can help victims within that community? And it can't be, again, resources from the state because we have our own way of thinking and our own languages and our own songs and our own ways of thinking of what's gonna protect us. So again, you can have the laws, you can prosecute and you have sentences, but what about the services? All of that falls under the umbrella of uh, cultural considerations when applying laws to human trafficking or sentencing or um, combating Earlier than the talk this morning, I'll probably, I know we're probably gonna discuss it this afternoon, is how do we bring family into this? You know, we can talk about laws, but the grassroots organization, those mothers from MHA Nation, they just, they decided this enough is enough. So within our communities, that's really what we're, what we have to do. You know, enough is enough, let's, let's go back to our roots because we've been resilient for years and years and years. You know, how do we get that and use that to apply to continue to protect our communities, continue to protect the people in our communities from human trafficking, specifically sex trafficking, because that's what we're seeing a whole lot more, but not to dismiss labor trafficking. Um, do we have time for questions? I think we do, right? But, okay, we have 10 minutes. Okay. so. The seven, the seven tribes that we were on the um, tape, the slideshow, Navajo Nation is one of them. Um, I went through, because I didn't know the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, which is located in North Carolina. They, they were the most recent to add to this, um, to their tribal ordinance. One thing that I noticed on there is they use the word prostitution in their, in their definitions. Um, that those are things I think we should understand. Like if um, a child, and I think that's Dr. Morgan, that's one of the, the things that internationally we talk about. A child cannot be considered or labeled as a prostitute because they're a child. So when you have those definitions within your tribal codes, you should probably consider changing that immediately because <laughs> it, it affects the mentality of a community. So again, language is very important. Let it be applicable to that community and what works best for them. But let's universally say, universally stay away from prostitution when describing sex acts involving children. Um, I think, any questions? Yes, sir. That's where I feel like I have a lot of conflicting information is are they are they able to prosecute major crimes in conjunction with federal prosecution as well? Or are there some crimes? Because I when we're talking about sexual abuse and those would all be considered major crimes, right? Right. And so how does the major crimes act factor into the tribal prosecution? Are they able to? Um, how does that work together? 
So it's a very good question regarding ma major crimes acts, which we did not cover. Um, there are major crimes acts, uh, and then there's general crimes. So major crimes involves um, the, the major crimes, of course, murder, sex abuse, rape. And the question is, how does that for Navajo Nation work? And does it work with the tribal codes, right? So for Navajo Nation, they have, um, they work very well with the FBI. So anything that's murder or abduction, kidnapping, it, it goes directed to the FBI. So FBI will come on and handle that case, which means it's a federal crime, right? I think with the Navajo Nation, um, when it's, they again have to answer the questions. Uh, is it federal, where did it occur, who are my suspects? But is there a code, if it doesn't meet the federal guidelines for a major act, they'll, they'll take care of it within their, their community, um, for, within the Navajo Nation code. I work for two tribes in Southern Arizona that did not use FBI. We were able to prosecute and investigate first any major crimes, whether it's a homicide or whether it was a kidnapping, we were able to do so. And um, we referred everything to the federal prosecutors. So we were fortunate enough that we had the training and we had the support to do so without the FBI's help. Um, FBI was certainly there to assist if we wanted to, but the sovereignty of that government ensured that we had we were capable of pursuing those. So it still fell within the prosecution and the guidelines for the major acts. So we had to hit the criteria for a homicide. If it was a non-native, that was our victim and suspect. I'm sorry, native, that was our victim and suspect. So it kind of just, it varies. There's not one answer for every tribe. But from what I know, Navajo Nation, it's basically just, they work together to determine if it meets that criteria of major crimes where FBI would come in and initiate the investigation and take that case for prosecution. If the if the Navajo Nation doesn't have that authority to sentence right now, and I'm not sh I'm not sh that was a very good question for Captain Henderson, but yes, it would go to federal. If the if they did, if the Navajo Nation did so, they could do both. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, do you want to come up here and say the question again? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So the the question involved. Um, if we have the situation of a non-native, I'm sorry, a native victim and a native suspect committing, being involved in a human trafficking crime, right? And where does that go? So my answer was if the Navajo Nation has authority and everything fits within the guidelines to prosecute within the Navajo Nation and they have established sentencing and, and all that involved with prosecution, they can definitely do so. And if it fits the criteria for federal, they can, they can prosecute within the federal government as well. Um, let's say the Navajo Nation possibly does not have enough criteria because of the elements of that particular crime. I'm almost certain it could probably still go under the federal charging. So FBI agent that's assisting on this case with the Navajo Nation and the criminal investigations uh, department would determine what, what would be best. And it's very confusing and I probably may have confused you even more, but we can definitely talk about that. My email is here. If you have questions, disputes, or you wanna do fact check, feel, feel free. Um, yes, sir. I'm sorry. I've been talking for about an hour. <laughs> that was my son was asking how long I've been talking. I guess that's my cue. <laughs> Let's go. Thank you for your time. A lot to uh, talk about and consider. I appreciate your time. Yes. Are there really prominent uh, human trafficking? Is it, is it for real? 
So the question is, uh, when we travel from, let's say, Flagstaff to community in the Navajo Nation, um, what we see is regular commuting time, whether it's for supplies or to visit family, the um, very respectable elder sitting here, and she's asking, does this really ha is this really happening? Is this what in, within this, whether it's within the, the road that we're traveling or within the communities that our people live in? The answer is yes. And it's not clearly, um, criminals are often one time, are oftentimes one step ahead. So it may not be in plain sight, sometimes it is, but human trafficking includes sex trafficking and, and labor trafficking. So it could be an elder being, um, it could include, you know, if, if they don't get their wages or their, their money, somebody's using them to, to do work, but they keep their money. They don't let the grandparents or the people who are working spend their money. It could be in that sense, that's elder abuse. It could be seen as labor trafficking. For human trafficking, what I saw for the community that I worked in, it was a child being auctioned on Facebook Live in exchange for narcotics. So it doesn't have to be in exchange for, for um, money. It could be in the forms of shelter. It could be in the form of food. It could be in the form of drugs. It could be in exchange for weapons. You know, so that exchange there could not, doesn't it directly have to be money. And what we're talking about sex trafficking is um, sexual activities and you're being forced to do so. But somebody else is being, there's, there's a transfer of money there. So I would say yes, and there's been a lot of cases. Um, I heard a story from a fellow, I'm just, I hope we have time, I heard a story from a fellow FBI agent. We were both doing presentations and he was talking about how his case involved child abuse, a child that disclosed he was being abused, um, she was being abused and it was by a boyfriend boyfriend's friend, mom's boyfriend's friend, I'm sorry. So what would happen is stepdad, or, or I'm gonna say stepdad, would take the child to the drug dealer's house and the drug dealer would give the, the stepdad drugs. He would leave that child there and go and come back a couple hours later. But what was the purpose of leaving that child there? The, the child, disclosed that um, abuse happened there, sexual abuse happened once she was left there. So the exchange there was between like he would say, here's my child, do as you may, give me drugs and I'll go and I'll come back. Um, he never talked about it, the child disclosed and they were actually um, prosecuted by the FBI. This is a major case. So this happened in on Navajo Nation. So these types of things, you know, it's not spoken. This individual, okay, this individual, because they didn't talk about it and he never told the girl, this is what you're gonna do, but it was just kind of you know, implied and that's the acts that we're carrying out. But these things are happening within our communities on any, by any means. And we're gonna talk about how to talk about, bring that back home. Thank you, sorry it took so long, thank you.